G'day, everybody. Welcome back to Paddlecast Quarantine Edition. I'm very excited about today's episode um, because it's with a guy I love catching up with, whether we're, we're recording it or not. It's Tommy Boudet Jr. from Canada, a three time Olympian, a gun paddler on a stand up paddleboard, and just an all round great guy who it's always a pleasure to talk to. We always catch up with Tommy over there at Carolina and in California. And last year, we were lucky enough to both be at the ICF Worlds in Qingdao, China. It's always a pleasure to chat with Tommy because he's got such an incredible knowledge about paddling. He is a three-time Olympian in sprint canoe with his brother Attila. Their father was actually the coach of the Canadian team and coached Larry Kane. Their uncle was the coach of the American canoe team and coached Jim Terrell. So they these guys go way back. And uh, Tommy had some great insights about not just sprint canoe and his Olympic career. We get a cool look at the, uh, the 2004 Athens Games. But um, just the crossover between canoe and sup, and I think that's a really untapped area of our sport and a very interesting way that we could get new paddlers into stand-up paddling. Anyway, uh, I hope you enjoy today's chat. The hour flew by. I'm going to have to get Tommy back on the episode because that was a lot of fun. Um, if you are enjoying these Paddlecast episodes, then you're invited to join Club Supracer. It's a way you can help fund the creative work that Supracer does. I opened the doors to the club yesterday, and I was very excited and very humbled and just very grateful that uh, a lot of people signed up on the first day. I think we had 34 patrons in the first 24 hours. So thank you to everyone that's already signed up for Club Supracer. If you haven't yet and you'd like to consider joining, you can go to supracer.com slash club and find out more. If now's not the right time for you to join, no worries. All these Paddlecast episodes will always be free to listen to. However, if you do join Club Supracer, there's a bit of a bribe. There's a few members only benefits in the clubhouse. And uh, one of them is early access to every one of these Paddlecast episodes. So all the Club Supracer members have actually already seen, uh, listened or watched this episode yesterday. So if you want to be the first to hear every episode of Paddlecast, then jump on Club Supracer, pledge a dollar or a few dollars a week, and you can become a member, get all the benefits, and of course, just help keep Supracer going, help fund all these creative projects I do and that I love to share with the community. I thought it might also be fun just to spotlight one of the uh, Club Supracer members each day. I think I'm going to call them the patron saints of Supracer. And today's patron saint of Supracer is Danny Leclerc. For a few reasons. The first one is I just like saying the name Leclerc. It's French. The dude grew up in France and I think he moved to Australia about 10 years ago. And Danny... The second reason I wanted to highlight him is because he's a great paddler, a very passionate paddler, and just sums up that spirit of the community. He's the kind of guy that just reminds you what makes the SUP community so special. Every time I see him at the events, um, which was as recently as the 12 Towers a couple of months ago here in my hometown, he's always smiling, always positive, and just loves being out there on the ocean with all the other paddlers. The third reason that I wanted to spotlight Danny as today's patron saint is because he's one of the guys that always encouraged me to basically ask the audience for some kind of contribu contribution. Like he was always suggesting I should start something like Club Sup Racer. So thank you, Danny, for your encouragement and belief. And um, I'm stoked that we finally launched Club Sup Racer. Jump on supracer.com slash club if you'd like to consider joining. And if not, just sit back and enjoy today's episode with Tommy Boudet Jr. Cheers. Welcome, mate, from over there in Canada. How you doing? Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. The ice is melted and uh, it's still kind of cold out, hence the hat. Uh, but I'm um, super stoked to be on the show with you. Yeah, cheers, mate. It's always a pleasure to chat. How's the uh, how's life under lockdown with uh, with the family? Oh, you know what? It's been, it's well, it's a crazy world we're living in right now, right? Um, but uh, I really have been enjoying my time. I'm lucky that, uh, well, I don't know. Well, I'm lucky with my wife for sure, but I'm not sure if she considered herself lucky because she's a teacher. She was, she's out of work. Oh, yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, she's taking care of the two older ones uh, every day. We have to do our homework and then we get to go. And, and now as the weather gets nicer, we get to go outside and play. Uh, and while the older boys are doing uh, their homework, they're uh, almost nine and seven. Uh, my little daughter, she's almost two. Uh, it's daddy's turn to uh, take care of her. And we, we go outside and play until the, the big boys are ready. And then, uh, uh, you know, try to keep her busy while the whole family gets together. Have you taken her out in the canoe yet? Have you got a new C2 partner? <laughs> um, she's been in my C1. Yes, she has last summer at the cottage. 
she's uh, she's been in the boat uh, nonstop, actually. Uh, the boys have their own paddle boards, right? They got my surfboard, and it's their board, so they they they're on it all the time with their cousins. And uh, but Mia, my my daughter, she's she's been in my canoe, uh, which we always do, and we have done with each of my kids. Put her in the front and the nose, and go for a lap. And uh, you know, all three kids have. Uh, have gone through that stage and, and, and they just fall asleep, right? They love it so much because they just feel the stroke, the power, and it's just kind of smoothing and all you hear is the water splashing. I, I'll tell you what, those were my first memories in canoeing because my dad did the same thing to me um, when, or myself and my brothers, and that's how I fell in love with the, with the sport. And now I get to do it with my kids. And uh, uh, Mia's been in a pleasure canoe on the sub board. She's been in my racing canoe. So, oh, yeah, she's familiar with water. No, nice. Absolutely. The next generation of the Boudet yeah. clan. That's going to be at least third generation, right? Because your dad was a famous paddler and your coach. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. So my kids would be the third generation. Um, yeah, if we call my father first, right? Um, and then Art, myself, my brothers, uh, I got two brothers, Ati, who I raced at the Olympics with, and my younger brother, Peter, who was a <laughs> kayak athlete. Um, so, and then all of our kids have uh, been in boats and, uh, and paddle uh, nonstop. Uh, our, our best time in the summertime when, when my brothers and I would get together with our families and all the kids go out and they're on, on the supports and kayaks and canoes and they're just on the lake paddling around. It's, it's super fun watching and, and that's pretty much exactly how we grew up uh, with our cousins back in Hungary. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, third generation and we're, we're ready to get them, uh, get them a little bit more competitive. Uh, this summer we're supposed to, we'll see what happens uh, with this lockdown. They were going to start, they were going to start to our, doing the club races. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the plan. So, so my brother's kids uh, have already started and, uh, and my oldest uh, Tristan said uh, this year I'm, I'm starting canoeing too and I want my own boat. And I was like, whoa, whoa, let's, let's just do a f- summer of program first and then we'll see how you do. But he's all into paddling 100%. Wow. So 2036 Olympics, the Boudet, the Boudet <laughs> brothers and the Boudet, yes. Boudet cousins are going to be up there. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. So, so my, my boys could do paddle C2, like, like my, my brother and I did, or my boys could team up with, uh, with my brother's son and, uh, do some, uh, yeah. Cousin Budai Budai C2. Exactly. Nice. Now, were you born in, we'll see. Were you born and raised in Canada or did you guys move there after you were born? Cause your family's no. from Hungary, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we're born and raised Hungarian. Um, well, born and raised until I was 11 years old myself. So my dad, my mom were 100% Hungarian. Um, and uh, in 1987, when I was 11 years old, um, we moved uh, to, to Canada. Um, my brother was, I think, 13 and my younger brother was nine at that point. Um, and that was 1987, just uh, before the 88 Olympics. Because my father had just retired from the Hungarian national canoe team, and uh, he was invited by the Canadians to be actually Larry Kane as coach. No for, way! Uh, just before the eighty, yeah, oh yeah, just before the eighty-eight Olympics. So, uh, so yeah, our family and Larry. I mean, Larry's one of my all-time uh, heroes, uh, and and he knows it too. He's one of the. Uh, and you know, with my dad, those, those two big paddlers. And then of course, uh, it's very interesting story. The whole, you know, my dad came to Canada and my uncle Laszlo, who, uh, who coached my dad in his early years in Hungary, he ended up coaching the U S national team. So he ended up coaching athletes like Jimmy Terrell. Uh, so the connection right there with Jimmy's family and, and, and my family. And at that point, Jimmy was paddling with Joe Harper, some of the other U S guys. Um, uh, we became, you know, really good friends. I mean, myself a little bit later on, uh, than Larry, cause Larry and Jimmy been racing each other since they were juniors. Um, but, uh, the family connection has, has definitely been there and, and a little Hungarian family, uh, you know, reached all the way out to Canada and to to the U.S. and 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 that family is still still holding together, right? The the paddling the paddling gang. What's your earliest memories of paddling with Larry and Jimmy? 
Ah, <sighs> uh, well, Larry, Larry's very early. Uh, I mean, we came to Canada because my dad got, I guess at first it was kind of like a temporary uh, position to coach uh, the Canadian national team. And like I said, this happened before the 88 Olympics. Uh, so he came out about six months before uh, he brought his family and uh, before he made the decisions like, okay, this is really truly something that I would like to do. Um, and then he got a contract for two years with the, with the Canadians. And then my dad was like, okay, I, I accept, but I would like to bring my family. And so, so that's how we ended up in Canada in 1987, September. Uh, we, you know, we said goodbye to our family and say, we're like, yeah, we're going to Canada. I had no idea what, you know, Canada back for me as a, a little communist kid from Hungary at that point, we're a communist, right? Um, America, Canada was kind of the same thing. So, yeah. so I, I didn't really know the difference. Uh, sorry, Canadians, but uh, that was me back then. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, so Larry, uh, I, I mean, canoeing has always been in our blood. Uh, we came yeah. to Canada because of canoeing because my dad was a coach. Um, so the first people we truly met were the national team athletes. And, you know, back then, you know, Larry was in his early 20s. And so he was like, oh, my God, I got and, – and Larry and my dad, uh, they knew each other from competing each other. So, you know, Larry was like, okay, I got Thomas Buda here coaching me. And me and my brothers, we were like, oh, my goodness, we're surrounded here by Canadian athletes. And this is Larry Kane. And, of course, like, you know, we, we watched races uh, – you know, in, in Hungary, where we heard Larry's name. And, and you know, this is a, a good story, too, where um, in the bathtub, I used to always pretend to be the American cane. Um, and we used to have those back scrubs, you know, that you kind of wash your backs with, or my dad had it, whatever. We never probably used it, but I used it as my paddle. And we used to <laughs> brace in the bathtub and I was commentating like the commentator does, like you do, and most of the races, here comes the American cane. Of course, he was saying Canadian cane, but for me, it was like American cane. And I was splashing water out, and my mom would be coming and go, what are you guys doing? So even back then, we were racing, and we haven't even started canoeing yet. So, wow. uh, so Larry's, been, Larry's been a big part of our life, and then I got to meet him. And then I got to sit in my dad's boat and watch my dad coach Larry and paddle. And of course, by that time, we started paddling too, by the time we came to Canada. So, so Larry was, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the idol for every Canadian athlete or, or young paddler at that point in early, uh, late eighties, nineties, uh, even in two thousands. Uh, I mean, Larry was still going for the 2000 Olympic team. So, so he was around and, and we've, we've always trained with Larry, um, uh, because we lived very close to each other and and my dad was his coach and there's many other guys that were you know made up the whole national team but surely enough as we went through our junior years to senior years we we kept getting closer and closer to these top guys and and then eventually we became the top guys and some of the older guys you know as we kind of have to we retired right and uh, but Larry's always been around coaching he's always been around um, helping us in 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 uh, even when we were competing and uh, and he wasn't competing anymore he was always there with my dad is always you know helping out technically or or advice so uh, jimmy jimmy phew, jimmy was pretty early on as well but you know i was a little bit older and i do remember uh my uncle actually went to the u.s twice to to coach and uh, when we were really young, he brought some of the uh, the U.S. athletes down to to Hungary, where our family cottage was, and and we met some of the U.S. athletes there. Jimmy at that point was way too young, uh, but later on, when I went to Junior Worlds and all that, of course, we knew the Americans, and and Jimmy was the best American, so so we knew of him. Um, and then uh, and again through Larry, uh, they used to always. Uh, you know, join each other trainings here and there. And, and we were always training with Larry. So, so we met uh, Jimmy pretty earlier on. <clears throat> and then I think I was just about graduating high school, 18, 19 years old, when, uh, when my uncle took his family, just like my dad did with us, 
Um, and I think that must have been, uh, what was it? Uh, I can't give you 90, 95, 90, 96, maybe uh, my high school graduation when my, my uncle's family. So my two cousins moved to Albany, New York to, to coach the, the U S team. Um, and, uh, my cousins didn't really, uh, want it. Well, my, my cousin Anna really liked it, but, um, the family wasn't, they were in Germany first, so they weren't that comfortable in the U.S. for some reason. Uh, so they moved back home uh, to Germany, but my uncle stayed. And that's the time when the U.S. Uh, team was, was coached for many years by my uncle. And after that, when my uncle moved back to Germany, uh, Larry and my, my dad as a coach, of course, invited all the U.S. athletes. And, and I got to train with Jimmy and, and, and those boys too. So that so was, was your that uncle was coaching awesome. Jimmy. Yes. So your My dad coached Lasso, Larry Kane who, and your uncle coached yep. Jimmy Terrell. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. So, the so day influence. Cool. And, yeah. Yeah. And then eventually, you know, when my uncle moved back and, and Jimmy and, and his teammates were, I, I wouldn't say coach, coach less, but, uh, uh, I, I do remember from at least from 2000 to 2004, uh, Jimmy was still around um, and, and our team trained a lot together. So down in Florida, we, you know, we were, you know, I was the young gun. Uh, they were the top guns, but uh, we, we were, we were around. Uh, and so when I fumbled into stand up paddle boarding, uh, <laughs> Jimmy was like, okay, Tommy, uh, what do you need? You need a paddle? I was like, sure. So, uh, so I'm blessed with the Jimmy Terrell family for sure. I remember, I remember hearing from Jimmy. It must have been 2013 or so. He was like, "I got this guy up yeah. in Canada. He was in the Olympics. He's going to be a star, Tommy." And he was like, "Man, I got to meet this guy." <laughs> yeah. I think he, he came down and did yeah. a race in Wrightsville. Was it? Actually, my very first big uh, international race was uh, California, San Diego, uh, Hano Hano. That's the one. Yeah. Where that's the one where Jimmy's like, Tommy, you got to come down. This is a flat water race. You'd be great at it. And I'm like, all right, all right. Like, let me see what I can do. And uh, so, again, the Terrell family took me in and they showed me around. And with Joe Harper, the, a good friend of Jimmy's too, who used to paddle. He lives in San Diego. Uh, they showed me around, right, the old paddling boys. And uh, and I ended up actually winning the race, which was, was quite good uh, for me. And uh, – uh, Danny Ching was there, but he ended up racing, I think, only uh, OC1, uh, lucky for me. Um, <laughs> but there was a couple other big guys there, and, and I ended up winning, and I probably surprised a few people, but everybody was like, oh, yeah, you're that that Olympian, the Canadian Olympian, eh? Ah, another one of those. I was like, yeah, <laughs> that's me, because they already met Larry. a few of you boys coming <laughs> over. <laughs> yes. And now the so, Eastern uh, Europeans are coming into it, huh? Oh, we saw it in Qingdao. So we were over there in China together for the ICF Worlds. And uh, some of those yes, boys sir. are quick. That Andre from uh, Russia in the sprints. On, uh, Andre Krator, I mean, he's he's a young gun who's built like a truck and uh, he loves paddling. <laughs> he's got some muscles. And, you know, he's, he's got, yeah, and he's amazing technique too. And in the sprint canoe, he was a legend. And, uh, you know, and all his uh, other Russian friends and, and we've seen how, how big the stand-up paddleboard sport is in, in Russia and, uh, and in, in Czechoslovakia or uh, Slovakia and, and, oh, there's Andre. Yeah, that's it. Uh, great, great guy. Um, I actually retired my spring canoeing before he came on the scene, uh, but he's always been super respectful. Um, he knows Larry, he knows myself, he knows all the canoe guys. And I mean, I guess these guys grew up watching us race. Um, so, so they're, they're these, these guys. And, and so when Andre retired, he ended up, uh, getting a coaching position for the, uh, for the Chinese canoe kayak team. So yeah. he's been there helping the Chinese team and they're doing quite well actually. So, uh, he's doing a good job. Yeah. Right. But yeah, the sport, the, the sport of stand up paddling and, and these guys, they love sprinting and they're good at it. And, and, and they just, you know, I mean, they, I don't know what the waves are like in Russia. I'm sure there is a place where they can go, but, uh, um, but these guys are good paddlers and, and like hungry uh, paddling is part of their, you know, blood and, uh, and it's a very popular sport. Uh, so uh, when, you know, you give them a paddle and teach them how to ride a surfboard, eventually they'll get fast. It's kind of the, is it the mecca of <laughs> canoe kayak, Hungary? Is it the superpower? 
Uh, I or would say yes. Up there I mean, with Germany? Uh, well, I or mean, even above. Oh yeah, in Hungary, uh, I would say above. If, yeah. if we look at uh, like the, I mean, the results. I mean, Hungary is just so powerful with canoe kayak over the over many years. Uh, uh, the Olympic medals, World Championship medals. I mean, Germany's big. Uh, Russia's big. I mean, most of those European countries are very strong. Uh, but that's the sport that they they live for. That's what they live on, right? Uh, they don't have. Uh, I mean, now they do, but. They never used to have uh, professional sports like like we have here in NBA and NHL and and and, and baseball, right? Um, their 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 sport is canoe kayak. In Hungary, it's a tiny little country. So if you look at in Canada, Lake Ontario, um, there we go. Look at that stats. So yeah, Germany, yeah, you boys Soviet have been cleaning Indiana, up. Russia. So so Hungary. I mean, for a tiny country. Uh, so I was going to say, Hungary yeah, look at this. If you go by total medals, I did this with Daniel the other day. If you go by yeah, total nice. medals, Hungary's on top all time, most winning Hung- yeah. in Olympic history of canoe wow. kayak. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad I got to uh, say that and I'm not wrong, but that's, <laughs> that is pretty amazing. <laughs> look at some of these stats. It's, it's pretty crazy. Why is it? You know? Why is it uh, su- such a strong part of the culture in Hungary? Well, we got lots of water. I think, uh, you know, the Danube, uh, the huge major river that runs through the country uh, is, is, is one thing. Um, and it's just supported, uh, it, well, because it had good results um, right from the beginning. So it's one of those sports that uh, we have great uh, in- infrastructure, uh, a lot of canoe clubs uh, around. I mean, look at that. That whole country is the size of Lake Ontario in Canada. So it's, it's like... It's a, it's just a lake. It's it's a tiny little country. Um, there you go. Budapest is the capital city. You got Lake Balaton is the biggest freshwater, mm. I think, in all of Europe. Freshwater lake. Um, not so much canoeing happening around there, other than like touring and, and a lot of that. But uh, but the the river which runs right through the center of the uh, of the country, which is the the Danube right there. Um, it, it holds a lot of canoe clubs. It holds. Uh, uh, it's just it's just a well put together sport where uh, you know kids are being taught from a very very young age, uh, different levels, different style boats that they can jump in and 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 you know get results right away. And it's it's uh, it's always been a popular sport, and uh, it just uh, it, it it does well. And we're heading there next year uh, for the ICF yeah. SUP Worlds. Actually, to that yes. big lake. I, yes, exactly. I am super stoked. Uh, uh, last, uh, la- actually, last year in China, uh, the Hungarian SUP leader was there, right? And uh, he was mentioning that, like, no, they're going to put in a bit for it. They're putting in a bit for it. And I'm, uh, and I'm, uh, Fulton Laszlo uh, Jr. I, I'm super happy that they got it. And I was hoping that it's going to happen in 2020 because I was so stoked coming out from 20 – oh, sorry, 2021. Uh, no, 2020 because we were in China in 19, right? Sorry. Um, so I was hoping that it's going to happen this year. But uh, it's going to happen next year. But it's in Hungary. It's in my hometown. Uh, I'm really, really looking forward to it. Nice. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I think yeah. it's exciting to see the potential for the canoe kayak culture to come into the sport. Like the same way that the – like the surfing culture, the prone paddleboarding culture, the surf ski culture, the windsurfing culture was probably the first one. And now we've got this whole canoe yep. kayak that you guys, you, Jimmy, Larry, were kind of the pioneers of. And now the Eastern <laughs> Europeans are getting onto it. It's kind of a scary thought. Oh, yeah. They're the Tahitians it, of it Europe. Is scary. <laughs> oh, but, that, but exactly. Like, I mean, that's what, that's the, on the other side of the world, you got the Tahitians who come from, from, you know, paddling backgrounds too, or whether you paddle a, a canoe with your, uh, uh, up on your knees or, or standing or sitting, uh, you're still, the key is that feel for the water mm-hmm. and, and uh, paddle men and watermen, that's what they have. Um, so that's why a paddler could always jump on and, 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 and do well if they spend enough time, you know, on, on the board or in a, in a OC one, in a canoe or any of that. So I think the key is, is definitely the, the touch and the feel for the water. And that's, that's that's what we all fell in love with, right? That feeling. So, how much time do you spend yeah. training for the Olympics? Give us, because you do, you guys do three Olympic programs, right? 
you and your brother in the yeah, C2? So, yeah. So, so 1996 was our first Olympics. We were quite young and in a way we were, uh, you know, lucky to be able to make it to those Olympics. Um, uh, I think at that point we didn't have such a serious cutoff internationally, uh, you know, cause now it's like, you have to be, I think in Europe, you gotta be top five country to qualify for the Olympics. Back then it was probably a little lenient. And, and, and for us in North and South America, I think it was top two, even possibly, or maybe number one, um, which it is right now. And only one entry per country gets to go in canoe kayak, right? It's not yeah. like track and field or swimmer where you have a fast time, you can qualify and you can have three Canadians or two Russians in there. It's just one. So you really got to be the best. So, so we were super stoked to go to 96, but it was a learning curve for us. We were young. I was coming off from my, you know, junior, you know, I was 19 when I qualified for the Olympics, 20 when I actually raced at the Olympics in 96. So I was still young. Uh, Sydney was a, a great year, but it's, it's literally is a four year contract that you're signing that, you know, you want to go for the Olympics and it's, it's, uh, you know, it's twice a day, every day. No if or buts, because, uh, you know, if, if, if you're not motivated enough, somebody else will be. And, and then, you know, like I, it was amazing today. I, I did a live feed uh, for SIC uh, about how to prepare yourself for a good training. And, and what I talked about was is, is motivation and, and being, you know, in a in right state of mode uh, to train. And that's the way you're going to get the best results. If you're in a good state of mind and you, train happy and, and, you know, you have your goal ahead of you. But one example for me was that my dad continued told us when we didn't want to go training, he says, that's fine. You don't have to train. You can stay home, but you know, somebody else is training. <laughs> and because you're not training, they'll probably train twice as hard. So that's okay. Bye. You know? Yeah. Uh, I was lucky enough that my personal coach was also my dad who kicked me out of bed. Um, <laughs> but he, he was, he was never that, you know, aggressive. He was very calm and always way too calm. I don't even know how he's so calm and why am I so, uh, so uh, not so calm. Um, <laughs> but he was always like, you know what? You don't want to train. You don't have to train. But somebody else is training. So he, he was and a nice, he was a nice coach. He didn't fit that. He was. An, he didn't fit that American stereotype of the Eastern European coach just cracking the whip. Oh, not at all. <laughs> not at all. He was. He the was angry Soviet super, coach. Super. <laughs> And and I think that helped us a lot with, especially my brother being uh, my my training partner or my teammate because we raced the doubles together. Um, mm. So it, it was it was quite. Uh, uh, I mean, most of the time you always remember the good parts of it, right? You don't remember the pain. You don't remember the crazy. Uh, I can't believe we're paddling in this freezing rain and the winds howling at us, and you know the coach is saying, "No, we got two more pieces," but you don't remember that. But you do remember the after effect of finishing a workout and just feeling like, okay, that was tough, but we did it. Yes. And then next week, let's do it again and see if we can do it better. And every single time you, you hit a, a, a challenge, uh, it's just to see how you can put yourself through. I mean, we didn't win every single race. Uh, I remember uh, even just to qualify for the 2000 Olympics. We had another Canadian crew who are, are great friends, but on the water, you know, we wanted to beat each other. And, and, and they beat us in our first set of selections. And in my mind, it was like, oh boy, wait, wait a second. This is not supposed to happen. But you know, every loss makes you stronger and better. And you know, we were fortunate enough to, to oh, what a battle that was too. And it came down to about like, you know, about this much, 30 centimeters to decide who gets to represent Canada at the Olympics, right? Um, we were lucky enough to, to win and, and be that, kind, be that, that pair of, of two boys that represented that year. And we're, I'm very happy because four years later, the other two buddies who just lost, they got to go as well with us. So, so we, we shared the two distances, the thousand and the 500 meters. So it was, it was, it was really good that, we all four of us were able to go to the Olympics eventually, but, uh, but yeah, training, training is like, I mean, it's, I want, I don't want to say it's a job because you love it so much. It's just something that we just wanted to do. And I don't think you become an Olympian without believing that, 
if if you're waking up every morning it's like, oh, I'm doing this because this is my job or this is what, you know, you're not going to get very far. And and my family, we've always been raised that, you know, love what you do and, and show respect to everybody else. And, and that's how we try to do, whether it was on and off the water, whether we lost or whether we won, um, you had to show respect. And, and my dad was the first guy to congratulate the crew that beat us. It's like, wow, good job, you know? And, and, uh, that's the way we grew up, and and that's how we train. If 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 uh, somebody else trains harder, you got to go sit down and talk it over and say, okay, now it's our turn to to train even harder to get back on the top. What's it um, What's it like? I see you got the corona there. Nice. Yeah, exactly. Coronavirus. <laughs> get it into me. It's too uh, It's too early on here here in Australia. I'll join you. But, yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> what's What's it like? The C two. It's such a unique looking event. It must be a whole different strategy when you've got to paddle. Larry was saying the other day that paddling in C2 is a whole different dynamic because you've got to have the timing with your partner. It really is. Um, we, I mean, I was lucky enough because I, I grew up in a system where we had lots of uh, training partners. And, and again, just like in the stand-up paddle world, uh, you, it's good to have training partners. Um, but when you're on, like, just imagine standing on one board and two people. And I know there is those those double uh sub boards i've never tried before but uh certain people have uh i think dave beanie and a couple of these guys have raced but seeing a c2 like that you are pretty much behind each other very tightly and whatever the guy in the front does the back guy feels whatever the guy in the back does the front person or front person i'm going to say because we have girls uh you know uh killing it in canoe nowadays too um, so you have to be absolutely uh, unified. You got to move as one, and 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 that's why you spend so much time on the water training. Is because every every stroke, every movement, especially in the 500 meter race, counts. I mean, that 500 meter race, when 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 this, these boats go top speed, you do a 500 meter in a minute 40, or sometimes even faster. Um, I, I think I don't even know the fastest time in a C two men C two maybe even a one thirty six maybe one thirty like so it's it's done so quickly so one mistake and you know a wobble and 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 you know the the crew feels it the person in the back has to keep the boat straight the person in the front sets the rhythm sets the 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 pace so so it's it's a it's a unified movement I personally think I was cheating because I got to do it with my brother. So <laughs> it was so much easier to yell and, you know, complain to my brother than a buddy of yours, right? Like, and, and a lot of these guys, these are, that's a Canadian uh, crew right there, Roland and, uh, and Paul, uh, who are a couple years younger than myself and my brother. But, uh, uh, you know, a lot of these guys, uh, they spend so much time in the boat together that they do become like brothers, right? Because to paddle boats like this, you, you have to act as one. Um, and you're, you're training together, you're living together, you're traveling together. It's, it's, it's not easy sometimes. Right. Uh, but me, I had my brother. So when it's your brother, it's like, you can do whatever you want and it doesn't really matter, you know, um, because he's still your brother. And if we fight, uh, uh, it's, it's okay. Cause we're going to be, you know, by the end of the workout, we'll be fine. Uh, <laughs> a lot of times, it was pretty funny a lot of times when we had a big training group in the national team or training before worlds or trials or something like that. Uh, when we're training with other guys and uh, our training perhaps wasn't going well and our English turned into a Hungarian yelling, uh, the other crews <laughs> knew that ah, the Budai boys, uh, they got some issues. Let's, <laughs> let's push it right now because as soon as we started screaming at each other in Hungarian, they knew that like, uh oh. <laughs> So yeah, these boys, they're, they're from, uh, they were that, that crew with that, I think right now they're representing, uh, Azerbaijan, but they used to be the Ukraine crew. So when my brother and myself, we were second at the worlds, these guys were third yeah, and right. they were young guns pushing us out of the, and then they ended up, uh, being a pretty pretty strong crew for many years after we retired. Man, those, um, those paddles are insane. How big are these? Look at this. So yeah, th these blades are huge. So if you, if you look at even a outrigger paddle, um, the outrigger, these paddles dwarf the outrigger blades. So they're they're some of these guys use twenty five centimeters wide blades. 
with I'm not even sure what the height is, but like way higher than a uh, an outrigger blade. So our our sub paddles compared to, the, to these paddles are nothing, but these paddles go to your nose or to your eye level, um, and and on in this position, I would say um, this is the most powerful position that you can get to moving a canoe to moving a boat. You're you're stable enough once you have enough practice to be lower to the water where you can apply a lot of pressure on the catch. Um, but you're not too close like in an outrigger canoe where you can't really have too much use of your legs. So if we watch a live video, you'll see these guys pump their legs absolutely amazingly and they use their full body weight. Now imagine doing that in unison with your partner, right? Just the power that these boats have and, and the speed that you can get these boats going is, is pretty fantastic. And certain workouts when you kind of just click and, and I can maybe count – on my five fingers, two or three races where my brother and I had perfect races, um, where everything came together and it felt like feather and the boat was just cutting through the water and we're flying and we actually did well, uh, maybe two or three in our whole lives, right? So you got to be so, paddling uh, like this, just almost, just perfect synchronicity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. How big, and, compare and you know one what? of these paddles to a QB. Say you got like the Q, the new QB, the UV. It's like a, um, so I, like a 78 yeah, right inch now paddle. Oh, so yeah, right now I'm using, well, height wise, cause I'm, I'm not very tall. Um, I'm 71. So, uh, my, my Olympic C1 paddle, if 71 reaches just over my head, um, I'm probably using a 65 inch height wise, like super short, right? I mean, in blade size, blade, how big is the blade okay, compared the to blade, it? Oh, I wish, uh, yeah. So a UV 82, which I have, it's probably, these blades would probably be three times the size. Wow. Yeah. So they're like 200 so they're plus short, square inches. I'm not sure if they're 200, but, but maybe just under. Yeah. Like they're, they're, they're big blades. And, and the funny, uh, the amazing thing too is, is is the girls, boys, they can rip him through just as well as, as anybody. And I mean, this is Laurence, our, our top uh, uh, female canoe, uh, 10 time world champion right here that you're looking at. Um, she's, you know, she's using the same size blade as uh, any any man out there. So, and and some of these girls paddle better than some of the boys. So it's, it's kind of cool to see. Uh, now, 10 years ago, if you and I would have had this interview, maybe I would have said like, I'm not sure if we'll see the girls in the in the world championships, but but our Canadian girls and 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 this movement really came from Canada to push the women into canoeing. It truly came from from our Canadian girls um, uh, back in 1998, 1999 when they showed up and they just just started paddling in front of everybody, and everybody was like, "Whoa, what's going on? That's a woman paddling a canoe." Um, so this was and, never a thing. Pushing it, women's canoe wasn't a thing. This was never a thing. No, not internationally, not at all. And uh, it's it's uh, thank goodness because you know I mean it's it's fantastic to see some of these girls uh, and and I watch some of the Europeans, or Canadian girls. Uh, they paddle. Their technique is flawless. They're they're fantastic and they're strong and they're fit and you know it's 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 cool to see. So how do you um, not tip and, this and thing have, over? Those boats look so. Look at that thing. Oh my god! Yeah, her butt yeah. is hanging out the that edge is, of the boat. <laughs> Oh yeah, so most of these boats are skinnier than our hips, right? If we're in our, you know, facing forward, uh, yeah, these boats are tiny, wow. and uh, uh, so yeah, the, we have them designed the same way as on a sub. Like you know, if you're a bigger person, you have bigger volume. A uh, smaller person will have so smaller volume, but we have uh, the same length, and it has to be the same uh, uh, weight. What's so the width? We only have what width. Two, are we talking here? Uh, That's like twelve inches width. wide. Yeah, that width is probably, yeah, not 15, 12, exactly. Uh, it's it's the bottom. So the bottom is is, is very uh, sharp, but you're not allowed to have a negative angle. Like, you know, we the, like our canoes no would not allow, there's no concaves. You're, you're not allowed to have a concave like we would have on our uh, on our stand-up mm. paddle boards. So they're even tippier. Um, but, <laughs> Uh, what uh, these things are very tippy. Oh yeah, these things are are super tippy. And uh, but uh, hopefully it's like a bike because I don't spend too much time in my canoe nowadays. Uh, most time on my board, but every time I hop in one, it's uh, 
it's uh, you know it's it's a good feeling. But it's it's not easy on the body, right? You're always on one side, and uh, you know that's why you got to spend a lot of time in the weight room, um, you know, to equalize the the muscles on both sides. So it's it's not an easy sport, but I think it's a it's a very it's a very pretty very beautiful sport. Um, if you know the sport and even if you don't, it, it's a, it's a unique looking thing. So it's like, look, it's, it looks like a toothpick. <laughs> That's crazy. Where I, I actually paddled yeah. one of these with Jimmy in California and, uh, that was a lot of fun. Oh, yes. I didn't last far, yeah. but, uh, Lincoln Jews actually jumped in it and he was a gun oh. straight away. That guy just had the yeah, balance. I, down. I, 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 I think I remember that video. Uh, you know, who else is doing this? There's a few guys out there in, uh, in your your land down and under, uh, Toby, Toby Tobes uh, is on it. Toby is uh, he's 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 doing quite well. He used to send me some videos. So Toby, if you're listening, send me more because I want to see how you're improving. Um, and uh, and uh, and Penelope from so, New Zealand. And she well, got some medals Penelope at the Aussie Championships. New Zealand. She's uh, yeah. I actually just recently chatted with her on on Messenger because I saw her video and I was like. Penelope, you're looking amazing. And she's like, oh, my God, thank you. Coming from you, this is great. I'm like, come on, you're, you're doing the work. Um, but uh, so, And I know Candice uh, Appleby, she likes to paddle in the sea one once in a while. So so it's, it's, it's fun to see not just paddlers or, or, you know, spring canoers coming over to SUP, but SUP athletes going over to spring canoe. And, and uh, so th- that's, that's always fun. Well, we've actually got a video here of when you and your brother were – in the Olympics, and you said there was a bit of a story behind this race, so um, I'm going to oh, I'm going to queue it up. Yeah. Paint the picture for us. This was Athens, 2004. <laughs> I found a grainy yes. old YouTube video before the days of HD, but um, it gives oh, a pretty yeah. good look Sorry at this race. That. No, this is that good. It, it takes us back to the time. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise! It's not in black and white, buddy. Like, exactly. It's like what you is that a VHS? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so Athens 2004. Um, so this is this is the final. It was happening around nine, ten o'clock in the morning, um, and a beautiful course. Uh, we spent a good week or maybe two weeks there with the Canadian team, the Olympic team, training on the course. Is so that you there? And forth between the, wait, that's me right there, just on the bottom of the yeah, screen. That's me in the bottom. bottom I, the I like that so you're rocking the bandanas. Was that your signature look? That was her signature look, bandanas <laughs> and uh, sunglasses, always. So that's you in the uh, well, back? That was my look. And my, yeah, it's me in the back, my brother's in the front. And so the first uh, two Olympics we did with me in the front and my brother in the back. And for the last uh, eight years that we paddled, so from 2000 to 2008, uh, we switched it up. So we didn't want to switch partners. So my dad's like, well, why don't we switch, uh, switch you guys? Um, and it was a good switch because my brother's taller. And overall, he was – always a little bit faster than me. So and usually in the front, you want the, uh, the better guy, uh, better technician, if, if, uh, if you may, uh, in the front. Uh, so it actually worked out really well, our, our switch, and it, it made us to be a stronger crew. Um, so that's it, rolling in. Uh, Wait, I just, got, I just uh, found maybe, a picture here, a really sharp one. I got to show uh, this. This is, uh, uh, this uh, is Hungarian <laughs> slash Canadian fashion right here. This is beautiful. Yeah. Let's get it up on the screen here. Look at this, Mike. Yeah. Wow. So that's, yeah, that was, that was, I I believe that was our heat. So that was our, our race to qualify. So that's me in the back, my brother in the front. And uh, so we picture this, we're not too massive. You know, I'm five, uh, almost five, nine. So I'm not quite five, nine, but my brother's five, 11. Uh, But my dad, he's like six, four. He's like this true Hungarian, you know, European big, big, strong dude. And, uh, and so we didn't come out like my dad, but, um, <laughs> we were very, we are very talented with technique, I guess, cause that's what really helped us a lot and our determination to, to do well. Um, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, so, so that was our heat and we, this is a 500 meter race, which is over. And I think this final was, I think a 139, uh, I'll give it away. It's this Chinese crew that one that was in yellow jersey there, right beside us. Um, and uh, so we're going into to this this race uh, 
feeling really confident. I mean, we had everything going for us. Uh, this was our third Olympic Games. We knew what to expect. We knew how to do things. Our training was right on. Our our preparation, our our timing, our our you know our really like everything was working well. And we raced uh, uh, the heat. And as you can tell, we got pretty good wind at our back. Mate, that's a downwinder. Uh, What's going on? That's a downwinder. <laughs> exactly. We needed our boards there. Uh, so that's the Russian crew in the white and blue, the German crew in the, the black boat, and then the China crew with the yellow jersey. So right here, we kind of slag back a bit. Um, and unfortunately, that's kind of how we always race. In a, in a longer distance, that was okay to do because we always had room to catch up. In a 500 meter, uh, a boat, like as you can see, we're almost a boat behind. That's almost a little too much. Um, but it does come down to a pretty good finish, and uh, we worked our way back in there. Um, but uh, So in the heat, we qualified directly to the finals. We threw down one of our fastest times which i think was like a 139 or 138 even uh to to qualify and that doesn't really happen for us usually we'd have to go through like the the semifinals and go to the finals so we knew we were in a in a good place um and every day we had a nice slight tailwind so it was it's perfect for us because we're smaller guys light crew and and that all that helps us right it picks us up and pushes us easier um, we don't sink the boat too much so we can ride those little bumps. Um, the day of the morning final, I woke up and we lived close to the beach and here comes the finish. And you're right a surgeon here, at the right? finish. You and need another like, 100 yeah, meters. We're, yeah. So 139.94. So that was the winner, which was not the Cubans. Uh, these are the Cuban guys. I think they ended up second. Uh, it was the, the Chinese, Chinese boys guys got it. and he's... He's, I remember looking over and he's hitting his head going, what, what, what happened? Because I know he was ahead of us. <laughs> but uh, it, it was so close that nobody knew how they finished, right? And uh, maybe the Russians got third. I'm not sure. But uh, so the, just to give you, and hopefully they'll show the, the slow motion, the top eight crew came in within that one second, 139 to 140, 30-something. Wow. Like it was that close. And the crew that actually came ninth, which was the, the Polish crew, uh, they were the defending world champion holders right there in the red. They were last year or the years before world champion. And they, they won by a second and a half the year before, right? So is this so, like an all-star historic clash? Does everyone talk the, about this final uh, in the canoe world? Oh, it's, yeah. It's still like the 2004 C2 final is like still like, a, oh my God, remember that? <laughs> it's like, yeah, fortunately I do remember it. I wish oh, we there's the photo look finish. At that. Yeah. Look wow. At that. Like so... So, so that's you boys right in the center, right in the center with the red boat. Uh, you know, we're close, but not close enough. Right. And, and any other race, any other world championships, if we would have been that close to, let's say, just compared to us, to the Chinese crew, if we would have been, that's a half a boat distance. That's usually guaranteed a second, second spot, maybe a third. Right. Cause we have come down to that, that close races, but to have, the whole final coming on that one practically straight line, that was kind of, that was pretty crazy. Wow. So to go back to tell you this story, so the morning of that final, I every morning what I used to do is woke up, we lived on the beach right close to where we were racing, and, and I studied the flags and I knew exactly which way the, the, the wind is blowing, which way is favorable for us and which is not so much. And uh, the morning I woke up feeling good, feeling pumped, and I go out to the balcony, I look, and I see the flag, and I'm like, yeah, it's blowing from the back, but it's also blowing a little bit from the right side, which means as a left, and I'm in the back as a left, and the only other right side or left C2 paddler who steers the boat was the Chinese crew who won. So see how he's on his left side? Yeah. So that man, yeah, you find, the they finally got the memo. And he, <laughs> yeah, they just finally realized that they won, that they won the gold medal. It's all, uh, these two are unbelievable. Yeah, they're, they're, they're like, what? We won? What? Ah! And they actually ended up winning four years later again in Beijing. So, so, so they are a pretty good crew. There we are coming There's in. There's you boys going, right behind them. Yeah. I guess, yeah, I guess Trade we didn't get a medal. Like, Looking good. Yeah, <laughs> that sucked. I mean, I mean, the race was awesome. 
But uh, so I look at the flag and I studied it and I knew that the wind is coming from the back, which is fantastic. But I can see that it was coming a little bit from the right side, which yep. means I'm myself and the Chinese crew were the only C2 that had left steering. That means us two, we had to do more steering than the 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 other C twos. Yeah, right. Just enough, just enough to do in the race. I didn't really notice it. I didn't really feel it. But I know it wasn't the same race that we threw down in our heat. And I think if we would have thrown down the same race in the heat, maybe we could have been. But maybe coulda, shoulda, woulda. Doesn't really matter, right? <laughs> but I just. That's the beauty of the Olympics, right? It's one moment every four years. Exactly. And that moment for me was looking out the window and looking at the flag. And of course, my brother's like, you're an idiot. Don't look at the flag. (laughs) And, you know, like he was always the reason and I was always just the energy. Uh, So, uh, but uh, I mean, we did everything we could in that race. Uh, We had a, we did have a really good race. We we put everything together. Uh, I wish we could have, stayed a little closer, uh, not let the top guys go so far uh, as we did there, as you can see. But uh, other than that, I mean, it was a fantastic race and, uh, you know. How do you steer a boat? It is. How do you steer these boats? Because they've got no fins, obviously. Yeah, so we got no fins. we got no no steering rudders like the kayaks do. So it's actually both guys have to steer. So so the guy in the front, he does set the pace, and he you know the guy in the, in the back uh, does most of the steering. But because you're pretty much equal um, left and right, you don't have to if, – if the crew is good and you're, unis, you're, you, you're together, you don't have to do too much steering. Now comes you add in the the weather with the wind blowing from left to right, and this is why I love stand up paddling so much because all my life I had to depend on the left wind or the right wind or the head wind or the tail wind. In sup, it doesn't matter because you switch sides, so it it's, it works perfect. Um, but in a canoe like this, the person in the back has to steer, so you have to do the J stroke where you know at the end of your, your stroke you're pushing away from your uh, from from the boat. Uh, and the guy in the front helps as well, too. He has to, you know, he sees it before you do. But, I mean, a crew like this and a, in a race like this and so much training, you just kind of feel what the boat's doing before it actually does it. So with quick corrections, and it's all, you're doing it all with your paddle. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a teamwork like we talked before. And, uh, and that's it. If, if a team does just a little bit too much steering, that's, that could be, uh, you know, a bronze medal loss there, or you're going from four to fifth to sixth to seventh, and, and that's it. There's no makeup. There's no nothing. You know, in the sup, you fall. You can climb back on and continue. I love that. In a canoe, you make a mistake, you're done. So Yeah, what happens if you ever tipped a boat yeah. over during a race? I don't think I ever tipped uh, in a race. In, in, in trainings, we tip all the time. It happens. You know, your, your, your paddle slips in the cold or it gets wet. Um, you hit a rock, you go on the other side. That's the worst nightmare. I remember growing up uh, in Mississauga, a uh, beautiful little river, but it's a shallow little uh, river, uh, the uh, Mississauga the Credit River. And uh, in, the, in the fall, when the water level starts going down, and we're out there morning, day and night, whether it's cold or nice. Uh, uh, so imagine there's a log or a rock just underneath the surface of the water, And you're coming down and you hit that with the blade and you're expecting that blade to submerge and to disappear into your next stroke, but it just bounces back. It just shoots you like you go flying out the other side. So, I mean, you know, you can hurt your shoulder too, but, but you just stick it in and boom, you just, you're out, you're out and there's nothing you can do. You you know, you're out in the back. And uh, so you, you, you do go swimming, but in a race, I don't, I, I don't remember ever falling, which is, is, which is a good thing, but maybe I have. Uh, you do end up falling at the very end of the race. You saw the guys like yeah. what, what we call What's the, the deal sh- with the, that the shot? when you shoot the finish yeah, there? I, try, I gotta find I a video of that. I try to do that in China. Yeah, I try to do that in China on my sub board uh, on the semifinals when I was trying to make the 200 meter sprint finals there. But um, it's a little bit harder when you're standing because – uh, so the rule is when you shoot your boat, it's your last stroke that you, you put in and then you just throw yourself back and you kick 
your boat forward and your boat kind of surges and and has that extra little surge to try to you know if it's that close you could edge your competitor out um but in a canoe you can kind of sit down because you're not traveling back so much distance from a standing to uh a, a total fall like on a subboard uh so if you're shooting on a subboard you got to be quite quite uh be careful that you don't fall and crack your board in half or you just jump off your board but i don't know if that counts because in canoeing if you shoot and you fall in the water before your boat crosses the line you're disqualified right because you never finished the race what's so the, it's always uh, a gamble when you so you basically yeah. just got to time Sorry. it perfectly that you're trying to fall into the water right after Yes. Well, hopefully you don't fall in the water, but sometimes you, you actually just throw yourself back so much that you just can't control yourself and you go in. I mean, that happens at the end of the races all the time. I mean, you'll see, like, there you go. Oh, here's Jan Vandry. Right there. I know this guy. He's done a few yeah. sub races. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he's, uh, I, I think he was down in uh, Florida this year and I saw him. He's the young gun who's uh, from Germany, who's pushing... Uh, so that's the finish the line, right? Champion. He's pushing himself over the finish line and then falling out. Exactly. So uh, <laughs> so you can see how he throws his body back so much and his nose of his boat just sh- surges forward. And and at that point, there's no... So it's like no a kamikaze move. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. It is. But wow. even, I mean, you could go from you could go from fourth to second or even fourth to first if you time it perfectly. And but that's that's the crazy part is is you could do oh, he's this a good shot. and and you could actually that's the oh yeah oh good friend Martin Doctor right there I grew up with uh, good friends with him uh, he's from uh, Czech and we raced Junior Worlds he's my brother's age actually he's two years older than me but we actually raced uh, uh, Molokai Ho together in uh, what year was that two thousand six I believe. We had an international crew, uh, uh, Martin from Czech, uh, Andreas Dittmer, who is from Germany, who is now the national team canoe coach. He's Olympic champion. Attila Vida from Hungary, Olympic champion. We put all these Olympians together and we raced the uh, OC6 race and we had such a blast. It was such an awesome paddling uh, experience. Uh, I think we came like top 20th, but uh, uh, it doesn't matter. Just just the crew that we were with were amazing people. So. So yeah, that's it. So what have you learned from the last kick? What can you take from C1 into SUP? What can SUP paddlers learn from you boys? You know what? Uh, Like we talked about before, the more I'm, I mean, I've been on a stand-up paddleboard now for over five, six years. And every year I tell myself I'm learning more and more uh, that I'm out there. Um, The stroke, uh, at one point I would have said it's the same thing. You know, it's it, it. You can really adapt the canoe stroke to to the stand up paddleboard. Um, I would say the opposite now. I, I think it the stroke is pretty much the same, but the way you apply your pressure, the way you apply your your technique as you're standing versus kneeling down is is different. And obviously, the boards doesn't run the same as a canoe. Um, so I think, and even in canoe right now, I can see the the transition going about. Back in when my dad used to paddle, where the boats were bigger, the, 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 the guys used to be bigger. They were big, strong, powerful guys. So they had big, strong, powerful strokes. As we got to a narrower board or boats, right, the, you didn't need to be so big. You didn't need to be pure muscle. You just had to be very fit so you can put more strokes in. And now I think it's even come to the point where we don't do crazy long reach anymore, even in spring canoeing. Um, we just want to spend more time in the water with our blades pulling than these big long reach and big swing and applying a lot of So you're of starting pressure. to do like Tahitian style, like the tap, tap, tap? A lot of tap, 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 exactly. And I think- So is this, uh, well, is this picture here more of it, like a traditional stroke? This, yeah, and, and my brother and myself, we really truly did paddle like the old, uh, you know, I would say the 90s, the early 2000s, where it was long reach, big stroke. I mean, there's each country has its own unique way of paddling. Um, uh, Canadians were very much kind of paddling, I would say, maybe like Hungarians or the Europeans because because my dad was the coach or, or that's, I mean, we always looked at the European technique, right? 
Um, Germans always had a unique technique, um, but pretty much the same long, big strokes. Now, you probably wouldn't see extensions this much. It would be a little shorter. The paddles would be shorter too, so you can paddle with a higher cadence. I mean, my brother and I, we never were the crew that paddled with crazy stroke rate. Um, you know, if, if in a 500 meters, we would do a 60, 65 stroke rate. Right now, the guys are probably doing 80 strokes per minute for that race. So, so the technique has really adapted and changed enough that, that the guys could do a lot higher uh, rate. So they're spending a lot more time in, in the water with their blades instead of in the air. So, and, and, and I think that's why SUP, we've gone down to shorter and smaller blades as well, is because we no longer need to spend so much time up front in the air to try to get that reach. You just want to put that blade in and pull it through. And we don't need to yank it all the way back, right? We just need to tap, 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 keep everything front uh, and keep that board running, just like keeping these canoes running lift them up and, and keep him running on the surface of the water. So, yeah, I mean, the, the stroke and the idea is the same, but even to, to this day, I love listening to Larry and I live listen to Travis and Danny and all these guys as we get together, we talk technique because we all get to share our, our ideas. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to give a shout out to Titu. Titu is one of my favorite paddlers technically and uh, I'll maybe he's an awesome guy too but I just wa love watching his technique Travis too Danny all these guys they're, they're flawless and now you see Danny and and Michael Boothy and and all these top guns and that's the fun part about this sport is you can watch him thanks to Sup Racer um, <laughs> live and uh, and you can learn from them and 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 that's it and you know so you might have paddling background but on the board it's different than in a sprint canoe so yeah. that's my little spiel there. I, that's what I think. No, no. So I think it's exciting seeing all the crossover between uh, what you guys have brought into the sport. And like I said earlier, I mean, yeah. you're basically one of the pioneers with Jimmy and Larry. So it's been good. Man, yeah. somehow, oh, thank you. this has already been an hour. I'm not sure where that hour went. Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. We, we could do a few wow. of these. We might have to do another one, man, because yeah, I've still got a bunch I wanted to chat with you about. Let's, um, <laughs> let's catch up again in a couple of weeks for another session because uh, that was a lot of fun Absolutely. hearing about the old days. Yeah, well, absolutely. I can talk about old days, that's for sure. I'm old now. So, <laughs> I'll see if uh, we can find some even grainier so it's, footage. It's easy. Let's go back to the 90s. <laughs> yeah. I'll get an actual VHS oh, I'm tape. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure my dad has a few VHS somewhere where we're racing juniors and I got long hair. I got no hair, right? So, Man, we're on the same yeah. program. I'm wearing a hat yeah, because I love it. my forehead's so shiny on this show yeah. all the time. But um. Man, yeah. it was a pleasure chatting. That was uh, it was really interesting to hear what you guys uh, what you guys have done the Olympic program and yeah. canoeing and its crossover yeah. into SUP. It's exciting, and I think we're definitely going to see it next year at Hungary at the ICF Worlds. That's going to be yeah. the clash of the um, the two worlds, the SUP and the traditional I, canoe kayak powerhouse. I truly, nation. I was gonna. Sorry there, but I was going to jump in there saying that's going to be truly a test to see all the old school paddlers coming out. And, uh, you know, jumping on the sub world, uh, I think it's going to be quite interesting. Uh, I hope it's going to be an amazing turnout, which I, I do believe it will be. And uh, I, I can't wait. It's going to be super fun. Yeah. Well, that's still 12 months away. Hopefully we get to catch up before then. Yeah. Go for paddle. <laughs> yeah. but, um, exactly. Put, a, put in a few strokes. Yeah. Until then, man, stay uh, safe and healthy and uh, have fun on the water with the fam. And uh, let's chat up. Let's chat again soon, man. That was good fun. Yeah. I like that. Thank you very much for having me and you stay safe and, uh, and stay out of the water because I know you guys are not out to surf, right? Or no, no, man. We're, or... we're, we're good. We're, okay, we're, the, good. we're the lucky country. Good, I'm going for surf after this. Get in there and surf. <laughs> All right, beautiful. Wow. Well, thanks for waking up so early. And Because uh, what time is it? Uh, you, you, you're, uh, it's, a, it's early for me. Is it with... oh, okay, good. <laughs> uh, well, thanks for doing it and thanks for having me on again and uh, take care and stay safe. All right. Cheers, man.